How many of you have done philosophy? How many of you are, say, philosophy concentrators? How many of you have taken philosophy courses? More, okay. So um, you know a little bit about how frustrating philosophy is, right? Right, I mean, it begins with wonder, um, as uh, Plato and Aristotle both said. Um, and you ask these questions, and um, as you may know from Plato's early dialogues, you ask a question about some great topic, such as, for Plato, what is justice? What is courage? What is piety? And you end up thinking about it and looking at various proposed solutions, and they don't work. None of them works. And you end these dialogues wiser only in the straightforwardly Socratic sense that now you know that you don't know something. You thought you knew what justice was or courage was, and now you know you didn't know that, but you don't know what it is. To a certain extent, the tale that I'm going to tell will have this structure. It's going to start with Hobbes and end really with contemporary, um, at least Western political philosophy, in the later work of the American philosopher John Rawls. Um, and it will start with a topic and what looks like a not impossible way of handling the topic. And then you'll see over time that problems arise. Um, and halfway through, we're going to shift ground and move, since it's about social contract, move from the idea of an actual contract to the idea of a hypothetical contract. And so take some questions halfway through. Um, and once again, we're going to find, well, there are problems everywhere. So um, I'm going to leave us um, maybe a little wiser than we started, only in the sense that you may have thought you knew what made sense from the standpoint of the idea of a social contract. I'm going to hope to show you that, well, not so fast. Now, one of the things that's distinctive, this is what I said applies basically to philosophy in any sub area. Political philosophy, especially in this way. Political philosophers tend to produce views as a way of addressing a contemporary issue. Um, and so the, what Hobbes is trying to do is geared towards his time, what Locke's trying to do, slightly later time, or also very much later time. Um, OK, so let's get going. The topic is political legitimacy. Um, one of the things that every state does is it coerces people. Weber famously said that a definition of a state is that it has a monopoly on coercive force in a given geographical area. Um, but coercion is usually thought to be immoral. If I go outside and at gunpoint take someone and put them in a room um, and keep them there for a couple of years, I've done something really awful, right? I'm not allowed to do that. But apparently, states do that. Now, there's some people who think that just shows that every state everywhere at all times has been immoral and unjustified. These people are called anarchists. They think there is no adequate justification for the state. But lots of people have thought, well, we sort of need the state for all sorts of reasons, but then we get this puzzle. What justifies, what makes legitimate the use of coercive force by the state? So there have been lots and lots of proposals about this. Um, and just as always in philosophy, None really, really works. But I want us to look at one. This is the idea that the state is justified in what it does because we've agreed to let it do so. We've agreed to found the state and to obey it. This is the idea of consent by the government. Um, it has a lot of appeal. It goes way back. You can find early forms of it in Book Two of Plato's Republic. Um, and in Plato's dialogue, the project. Um, but it really begins to sort of take off um, in the early modern period in the 17th century. Um, and as I say, it has some sort of intuitive appeal. After all, it seems to have the general structure of a promise. We've all agreed to do something. We've taken an oath. Hobbes calls it a covenant. Other people call it a contract. And usually, Promises are, are binding. If you promise to do something, it's, you're supposed to do it. That's a real reason for you to do it. You, you've done something wrong if you don't keep your promise. So it looks as if there's something 
that makes sense here. Um, and historically, you can see why people might have thought in the mid 17th century, early to mid 17th century, that this idea of a contract might make sense because actually it looked as if people were doing that. They discovered this place, America, and they found in America a couple of things. First, they found aboriginal peoples whom they believed had actually lived in a state of nature and agreed in some way to form communities in this state of nature. And so they thought they actually had evidence of a social contract happening. And then they had another piece of evidence. Colonists. People would head from England, say, um, for instance, to Massachusetts on the east coast of the United States, and they'd form a colony. And famously, one group, the Pilgrims, actually did um, swear on oaths. Now, I'm going to try to do this business of PowerPoint. So we're not yet up to Ha. Um, so I see. So this is a, well. We'll get to, to this. So just look at your hand out then. The first um, passage there says as follows: We do solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. So this is the Mayflower Compact of 1620. So they actually made a covenant with one another that they were going to live together according to certain rules. They were going to form a, what is the phrase, a civil body politic. So by the time Hobbes is writing um, in the first half of the 17th century, in his great work, Leviathan, is published in 1651, but he was working on the same ideas a little earlier, um, you can see why there might be this sort of appeal. Um, and so Hobbes appeals to the social contract both because you see it out there, but because he's also trying to solve a problem. And the problem for Hobbes is, how do you get people, mostly Protestants and Catholics, and included in Protestants different types of Protestants, um, to stop killing each other? Hobbes was writing during the wars of religion. Hobbes um, wrote, uh, Hobbes was born in 1588. Um, he liked to mock himself because uh, uh, 1588 was the year that the Spanish Armada came to England, and everybody was very scared um, that the England was to be overrun. Um, and so Ham said that um, fear and he were born twins. Um, and fear is crucial to his view. Um, he lived through the English Revolution, in which uh, Charles I was beheaded, and he fled. He said he was the first of all that fled, again, uh, suggesting that fear uh, was a major motivator of human beings. And he saw civil war. He saw what it did. He saw in France um, that there um, was further the French was a Catholic country, um, and it was suppressing its Protestant minority. And so he was very worried, how do you get people to stop killing each other, not to descend into civil war? And so he said, well, we have to think about what human beings are like. And this is one of the key features of the social contract tradition, indeed of any political philosophy. Um, but you can see it very powerful in the social contract tradition. The kind of thing that you get in a state, the content of a state, what it is that a state may do, what the government may do, is going to be determined by your views of what human beings are like. And Hobbes' view of human beings was good. His view was that human beings are basically selfish, they're motivated by their own interests, and they're fearful. Now, what basis does he have for this? Well, on the one hand, just himself. So um, the number in here is a little off, because there are two number twos um, in the, uh, the passages. The brief number two from John Locke is simply his phrase, in the beginning, all the world was America, which was generally going to be held by the social contract theorists that what they found in America um, was a kind of Ur, um, 
on the extended affairs um, that Europe had once been in. But now let's read this other number too, and this is Hobbes at the very beginning of Leviathan. And here he's trying to explain how it is that he can say what he's going to then say for 600 pages. But let one man read another by his actions, never so perfectly. It serves him only with his acquaintance, which are but few. He that is to govern a whole nation must read in himself not this or that particular man, but mankind, which though it be hard to do, harder than to learn any language or science, yet when I shall have set down my own reading orderly and perspicuously, the pains left another will be only to consider if he also find not the same in himself. For this kind of doctrine admitteth no other demonstration. So what Hobbes is saying here is, political philosophy requires you to have a view of what human beings are like, specifically what we're like as political animals, as beings who are forming a society together and must live together. So you're going to have to have a view about what our interests are, what the interests are that drive us into politics, and are what, our, what our motivational capacities are like. And depending upon what you think our interests are, and depending upon what you think our motivational capacities are, and what you think the actual world out there is like, you will end up justifying different kinds of regimes. I'm going to show this with Hobbes and Locke. So Hobbes thinks that we are driven by fear. And he thinks that in the state of mere nature, there is no morality. By that he means that, in fact, nothing is either just or unjust. In the state of nature, he thinks we have, as he puts it, the right to all things, including one another's bodies. His view is that the concept of right and wrong, justice and justice, comes into being with the state. That it's only once you have civil laws that you have this idea. Um, and so for him, in the state of nature, we are not doing wrong when, for instance, I grab something that you have because I need it for my self-preservation. You're not doing something wrong if you hit me to keep me from grabbing it. And I'm not doing something wrong if I hit you harder to get it. None of this is wrong. We are not violating anybody's rights in the state of nature, according to Hobbes. And you can easily see that in the state of nature in which there's scarcity, we are going to be led to what Hobbes calls the war of all against all. And we're led to that by three things. One, for Hobbes, is there's not enough to go around. So I want that pineapple that's sitting there, so do you. So we may fight for it. And by the way, even if I have a pineapple, if I'm prudent, I'm going to worry about tomorrow. So I may need more than one pineapple. Um, and so I'm going to fight anyway. That's the first cause of conflict. The second is what Hobbes calls diffidence. Um, now, by that he means that if you are prudent, you're going to be scared of other people. And so even if you're a peaceable sort, you're going to look around and you're going to worry that the next guy over there is not a peaceable sort. Even if I'm content with my one pineapple, I'm going to be worried that somebody walking by is eyeing my pineapple. And so I might think to myself, I have two choices. I can wait till he attacks me. Bad idea. But I'm not vulnerable, right? He has the, the element of surprise. Or I could say, wait a second, I want to be safe. Better safe than really, really sorry. Remember, the state of nature if you're the loser in a fight, that may be your last fight. So, the rational thing to do is for me to preemptively attack this other person. So now we can go one further iteration. This other person looks at me, and he thinks, there's Brudney. Brudney has a pineapple. He doesn't need a pineapple. I've got my own pineapple at home, this person thinks. I don't need to attack him. But look at Brittany, he's eyeing me as if he thinks I might attack him. So now he's going to preemptively attack him. So then what should this person do? Come on. Attack! So diffidence is another reason why, even if you would be content not to be in conflict, the rational thing to do is to preemptively to attack. Finally, Hobbes thinks there are some people who just like to be victors. 
glory is what they see. They, they want to be on top, to see someone prone before them. And so once again, if I'm worried about those people, the thing for me to do, even if I'm not a glory seeker, is preemptively to attack. So Hobbes thinks that the state of nature is a war of all against all. And he thinks that the worst thing that can happen to us is to be killed. He thinks that's what we fear. And so Hobbes thinks that the rational thing to do is for us to come together and to set up a sovereign. And the sovereign will be someone. We promise to one another that we will obey the sovereign and do as the sovereign says, and the sovereign will keep peace. And Hobbes thinks that what the sovereign should do, should have in the way of power, is absolute power. Hobbes was living during the English Civil War. England had a divided government. There was the king and there was parliament. And they quarreled about such things as who could levy taxes. And in the end, the quarrel, which also had a religious basis, escalated and became civil war. So Hobbes thinks that if you have divided government, you will have civil war, because people will quarrel over where the dividing point is. Um, so the United States has a divided government. And you might say, see, it, got, got a, it survived. But actually, it didn't. We had one notion of the division of our government, which is into these three branches, the executive, the president, the Congress, and the courts. We had another notion of division between the federal government and the states. And about 150 years ago, we had sort of a modest disagreement about um, what was involved in this division of powers between the federal government and the states. And just as Hobbes said, in the end, it led to civil war. So Hobbes thinks that if we are not to descend back into the war of all against all, which is what civil war generates, better to establish an absolute sovereign. And that's because he thinks we are selfish and fearful. Now, the quote labeled number three is Hobbes' attempt to convince you that you are selfish and fearful. Because having spelled this out, he says, yes, reader, you think I've got this terrible view. OK, so now he then says, let him, the reader, therefore, consider with himself. When taking a journey, he arms himself and seeks to go well accompanied. When going to sleep, he locks his doors. When he even is in his house, he locks his chests. And this one, he knows there be laws and public officers armed to revenge all injuries shall be done him. What opinion he has of his fellow subjects when he rides armed, of his fellow citizens when he locks his doors, and of his children and servants when he locks his chests? Does he not there as much accuse mankind by his actions as I do by my words? Now, there you have it. If we are the kinds of creatures that Hobbes believes we are, if his reading of mankind, as he says he's doing, is accurate, then maybe we need an absolute sovereign to keep us from the war of all against all. Looking at the world in the middle of the wars of religion, that's what Thomas Hobbes thought. And so he thought that the way to understand government is as a social contract that we all agree to, um, to institute an absolute sovereign. A generation later along comes John Locke. And Locke is writing at a different time. He's writing, there's some debate as to whether he's writing um, before the Glorious Revolution of 1688 or after. His book, The Second Treatise of Government, is published afterwards, but um, there's some scholarly debate about whether he was writing before. And he has a different view of human beings. For Locke, human beings are moral beings, even in the state of nature. In the state of nature, we can grasp through the light of reason what he calls the fundamental law of nature, which is that the innocent shall be protected and we won't hurt anybody, and that we can even punish malefactors. Here we have Locke. Um, the Revolution of 1688 established parliamentary supremacy. It established limited monarchy. Locke says the state of nature isn't so bad. The state of nature 
People are, for the most part, moral. In lockstep of nature, you even have commerce. You actually have money formed by agreement. And so when things get a little inconvenient in the state of nature, he asks this question, what kind of government do people in the state of nature agree to form? And his answer is a limited government, because the state of nature isn't so bad. And indeed, the way Locke sees it, being subject to an absolute sovereign is the worst state of affairs, because then you are prey to whatever he wants to do. You have no defense against him. Locke's state of nature is better than being subject to an absolute sovereign because, for Locke, people are moral people, and that's how we understand them when we think about what's involved in starting a government. And so, for Locke, the only rational thing to do with respect to a state of nature would be to leave it for a better condition, and that would be a limited government. And so you see that depending upon how you think of human beings and their motivations, and depending upon, and this will contribute to how you think, what you think the state of nature is like, how awful it is, or how reasonably decent it is, you will end up thinking that people would agree, if they're rational, either to an absolute government, absolute sovereignty, or a limited one. And so it's going to be, how do you think human beings are like? What are the interests that they have in setting up a government? Now, this is the theory of the actual contract, that people actually contract. One obvious question is this. When did this contract get signed? So there we have the Mayflower Compact. Fine. You know, 273 pilgrims, or however many there were, they're really bound by this because they really did sign on to this Mayflower Compact. That leaves a lot of people. Um, and so one big puzzle about the theory of the actual contract is, it's supposed to be a historical event. Could you show it to me? The answer is pretty much no. Um, with rare exceptions, nobody actually agrees to a government. There are some people. They're called immigrants. Right? They come into a country, and if they're in a country which will allow them to be citizens at a certain point, they become citizens in the United States. There's a very formal sort of celebratory event at which um, they're sworn in. They actually take an oath to the Constitution of the United States. Great. Again, that leaves many hundreds of millions, just in America, who are somehow th still thought to have an obligation to obey the laws, but they didn't sign up, apparently. Um, so well, Hobbes and Locke are aware of this. And indeed, it's a problem in the United States when we think about the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution might be thought to be an actual contract. In some sense, it was. It was signed by representatives of the various colonies, put aside for the fact that for the moment that neither women nor African Americans were represented in all of this. But um, there was something like signatures, famously John Hancock's great big egotistical signature. Um, but we can now ask, wait a second. So I'm an American. I'm supposed to be bound by the laws of the United States. I didn't sign the Constitution. And so we have this question. What's going on with this theory of the actual contract? So the proposal that's made is, well, you may not have explicitly and deliberately taken an oath, but you did something anyway. You tacitly agreed. And so we have this theory of tacit agreement. Um, and on the one hand, yeah, maybe this thing's OK. You know, it's true, I haven't created a revolution. Um, so in some sense, does that mean I've tacitly agreed to the government of the United States? Uh, um, the problem with this theory is this. Agreements are supposed to be binding when you have an actual menu of choices such that your agreement really is a real one. Um, when the mugger says to me, your money or your life, he's giving me a choice, right? <laughs> and if I give him my money, there it is. I, I, I chose that option. Um, but something seems amiss here, because if the policeman comes along two seconds later and arrests him, 
and I said, give me my money back, something's amiss if he says, well, what are you talking about? You gave it to me. I gave you a choice, <laughs> and you opted, you know, money rather than life. Um, so there, that doesn't seem right. And what's wrong with it is, it's not a real choice. It's not the kind of choice that binds. The real choice is one that binds, um, that has to be made against a background of an adequate menu of choices. If what he said is, your money, your life, or you can go free, and then I'd given him the money, that might be a different story, right? Um, and so the problem with the idea of tacit consent is, it seems to really work only if, in fact, it would be fairly easy for you to leave. So, um, it's, if, for instance, I had oh, $50 million in a Swiss bank account, and I spoke fluently four or five languages besides English, and the countries, the governments of these four or five other um, uh, places where I speak the language were happy to have me come in and, 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 and spend my life there, maybe we could say in that case that by staying in the United States, I tacitly consented to the American Constitution because I had a real choice. How many of you have $50 million? <laughs> um, for most people, it's a practical impossibility to move. I mean, people do it, but they do it out of desperation. And when they do, it's hard. They often have to give up their assets. Um, Let's change my view on this. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, here, I'll take off my jacket. I don't feel my jacket is. Um, so, um, so most of us can't really be said to tacitly consent merely because we stay somewhere else, um, because it's not a real choice to move. Now, so we find that this appealing view, the idea of a social contract, um, when we press it and ask, does this explain why we are bound to our governments, turns out not to really work, because it's supposed to rely on the thought of an actual agreement, and it doesn't look as if any of us had actually agreed. So we need to shift gears. Before we shift gears, questions about Hobbes and Locke, what I've said so far. Um, Um, I do have a, que have a question about uh, Hobbes. Um, you mentioned about absolute power, mm -hmm. but I know for a fact that for Hobbes, he also gave the individual citizen a kind of power, which means that they, they can al always defy the ruler if, that, if the ruler is trying to take their life. Right. So is there a contradiction here? Yes. And there that is, always there is, troubled there, me. There is a practical contradiction in Hobbes' view which is um, Hobbes says that when I covenant, form the social contract, it's an excellent question, absolutely on target, um, I give up all of my rights to the sovereign, except one, my right to defend myself. That I cannot give up. And what that means is that although the sovereign is doing nothing wrong if the sovereign comes to kill me, I'm doing nothing wrong if I resist. And similarly, and this is where Leviathan self destructs, if the sovereign needs my help to defend the polity, um, and I say to myself, wait a second, I signed up for this polity in order to protect my life, it doesn't look like it's such a good deal now if the sovereign wants me to go into the military and risk my life, then it looks as if, in fact, I'm acting rationally and permissibly, permissibly when I don't defend the polity. But of course, we get into the standard collective action problem. If everybody feels that way, the polity will fall apart. And Hobbes is stuck there. So you're absolutely on target. There is a pragmatic contradiction in the view. Anyone? I'll ask one. Um, do either of these philosophers uh, talk about uh, the relationship between nations the same way that you described uh, their relationship between individuals? 
I mean, um, they don't go on at length because um, each is focused on domestic troubles. Um, but um, uh, Hobbes is clear that the um, relations among nations is a state of nature, um, and that it is governed um, by the political interests of the different nations. Um, and in that sense, um, there is not going to be, in the absence of there is no world state, there's not going to be moral norms. Locke does not talk about this, but you can see from his view, because he thinks that there are moral norms, even in the state of nature, that is prior to government, what he calls the fundamental law of nature, which he thinks we can naturally know by the light of reason, uh, basically don't harm others and protect the innocent. Um, that would carry over into international affairs as well. All right, so let's shift gears now. Um, keep in mind that what Locke says is the state of nature is a better place to be than to live under an absolute sovereignty. It's rational to leave the state of nature, rational to give consent to a government, only if it's a limited government. So notice what we've done here. We focused on what our interests are and what is rational for us to agree to. Our interests are living peacefully, but living peacefully in such a way that we are secure in our rights even against the government. Um, that's the meaning of limited government. Um, now, what we then see is that what's really doing the work in the end is actually not a historical event of agreement, but asking what kinds of political arrangements would rational people who know their interests agree to? Listen to the way I've described that. What kind of political arrangements would rational people who know their interests agree to? Not did, but would. And all of a sudden, we're shifting away from the idea of a historical event, an actual contract, to the idea of a contract, what gets eventually called a hypothetical contract. And now, in all things, Jean-Jacques Rousseau straddles both sides because he has the great gift and vice of being an autodidact. He did not have real formal philosophical training, but he was incredibly brilliant. And so he had all these different ideas, and it's not clear how they all fit together. And so you can find in his social contract works moments where he seems to be saying, I'm talking about actual events, and then you find other moments where he says, oh, no, no, forget everything actual. Forget history entirely. And commentators have long struggled to figure out how to put them together, these parts together. I'm not going to try to do that here. What I'm going to do is move us along to Immanuel Kant. Because Immanuel Kant was the first who said, you know what? We're not actually talking about a historical event. We're talking about what he calls an idea of reason. A social contract is an idea of reason. It's what tells us what people would do, and that tells us what counts as a legitimate government. So he thinks that no one would contract into an absolute government, and so he thinks that only what he calls a republican form of government is legitimate. Now, he doesn't develop this view at great length, and so I'm not going to linger here. The general idea of a social contract took a kind of a nosedive after Kant. We can talk, if you like, in the question periods about what replaced it, but it went away for a century and a half. And then in 1971, it was rehabilitated in the book A Theory of Justice, by this man, John Rawls. Rawls was writing, the book really was written between the late 50s and through the 60s. And so he was writing about the events in America in the 1960s. Um, the Civil Rights Movement, the Great Society Programs of Lyndon Johnson, and he was trying to give an account um, that would philosophically ground all of that. Um, and he decided to do it through the social contract um, but his was avowedly a hypothetical concept. So he invented the following idea. He said, look, when we're thinking about what kind of social arrangements to have, 
Here's how we should do it. We should imagine that we don't know certain things about ourselves. For instance, supposing that I knew my race. Well, when I try to put together political arrangements, I might be slanting them towards someone, or towards people of my own race. Or to, um, I was born in New York City. So maybe I'd say, well, gosh, let's have everybody who was born in New York get 50 times the average income. Uh, now, presumably that's these smiles. Presumably you're smiling because you think, there's nothing morally relevant here about being born in New York City. Um, so you think that that's not a justifiable proposal. It's just a self-interested proposal on Brittany's part. So Rawls' thought was, well, let's, let's, so Brittany shouldn't know where he was born. So then he won't make that proposal. He can't make it because he can't propose that 50 times the average income go to people who are born in any particular place because he doesn't know which place to pick. Same thing about race. So let's say Brody doesn't know his race. Same thing about gender. Let's say he doesn't know his gender. Same thing about height, weight, what your view of the good life is. Let's say Brody doesn't know any of those things. I'm behind what he calls a veil of ignorance. And this is the place he calls the original position. His idea is that what we would agree to behind the original position has a kind of moral force to it because it's not selfish. By definition, it's not. Since the, the, the ability to make it be selfish has been removed since I don't know anything about myself um, from behind this veil of ignorance. So we get a whole new idea of the social contract. That political arrangements are those that people behind this veil of ignorance would agree to. He has a famous content for this. There's these two principles of justice. One is about liberty. One is about redistribution so that those who are worst off are as well off as possible. Um, but um, for our purposes, the key thing is the method, this new way of thinking of the social contract. You, for instance, you could agree with Rawls that something like the original position is the right way to think of how to justify the state, how to get content for it, to say only a state that is the kind that would be chosen from behind the veil of ignorance is a legitimate state. But you might disagree with him about what would be chosen from behind the veil of ignorance. You could have Agree about the method, disagree about the outcome. I want to stick to the method. A lot of people thought that this was a very, very powerful view. But there is, as always in philosophy, a problem. And that's that the view is merely a hypothetical view. Right? We have this thought government through the consent of the government. But when we talk about that, we're talking about the actual consent of the government. A hypothetical consent isn't actual. It's just what you would do under certain circumstances. To give you a sense of why hypothetical consent doesn't really, anyway, doesn't obviously have moral force to it. Let's take a different example. So let's imagine some capitalist. We'll call him Donald Trump. And he's suddenly seized with a desire to be a philanthropist. But of course, he's still a capitalist, and risk is the essence of capitalism. So he won't simply give his money away. Instead, what he does is set up a lottery. The lottery has the following form. You pay $100, and you get a ticket. The next day, 95% of the tickets will be redeemed for $1,000. So that's a pretty good deal, right? 5%, however, are worthless. The next day, a little zero shows on it. Um, so there's risk, right? But one ticket to a person, but you can buy one for a friend. I'm there at the lottery, I buy a ticket for myself, and I'm feeling philanthropic myself, so I think I'll buy a ticket for somebody else. I randomly choose through the phone book, aha, I'll buy one for this guy, Barack Obama. <laughs> I try to call him to get his consent. Can't reach him. But I think, look, this is a good deal. $100 for a 95% chance of getting $1,000. He would agree to it, right? If he's rational, he would agree to this. So I plunk down another $100, get a ticket for Obama, I write his name on it to make sure it's not confused with mine, and then the next day, it turns out his ticket has a zero. It's worthless. 
I finally reach him, I explain the situation, and I say, Mr. Obama, you owe me $100. Did I see it? Presumably not. He didn't agree. It's true, he would have agreed had I reached him. He concedes it would, would have been rational to agree, but he didn't agree. And so he doesn't owe me anything. The point here is hypothetical consent isn't binding consent. This point was made to Rawls throughout the 1970s. And so he reformulated his view. And now we get to a new way of thinking about what's going on. In this new way, and then I'm going to bring this to a close, he conceived of this idea of the original position, where you don't know anything about yourself, as a way, as he puts it, to model a certain view of what persons are, namely as free and equal rational beings who have two interests. One interest is in what he calls pursuing a conception of the good, what the Declaration of Independence calls the pursuit of that. Um, and the other is an interest in acting justly. So like Locke, he thinks that we're moral beings. And what Rawls thinks is that the veil of ignorance, the original position, sort of places us as if we're just that, free and equal rational beings with these two interests. And what that then means is that whatever comes out of the original position is the set of arrangements that someone who sees him or herself as a free and equal rational being with these interests would feel is the right arrangement for them, would fit the kind of being that they are. And in that sense, it's not so much that anyone's consented to anything, it's that we've used this idea of consent as a way of finding the political arrangements that fit human nature as we think we know it to be. And then we come right back to Hobbes. A human being is like. And we come right back to this thought if you do political philosophy, you have to start with a picture of what human beings are like, how far we are moral beings, and how far we, what kind of interest the state exists to advance on our party. And so, um, the task of political philosophy is to articulate a public conception of justice that all can live with who regard their person and their relation to society in a certain way. What justifies a conception of justice is not as being true to an order antecedent to and given to us, but its congruence with our deeper understanding of ourselves and our aspirations, and our realization that given our history and the traditions embedded in our public life, it is the most reasonable doctrine for us. So like Hobbes, Rawls ends up saying, I'm proposing something that a, a view of political institutions and what makes them, in his view, just, that fits certain kinds of beings. And if you think you are that kind of being, a free and equal rational being with an interest in pursuing the vision of, your, of the good and having the liberty to do so, and also with an interest in exercising a capacity, capacity to act justly, that is not simply to be selfish, but to obey just rules. If you think you're that kind of being, then his view fits you. And that's why you have a reason to obey those rules. Because it's, so to speak, a set of institutional arrangements which allows you to be yourself. But if you don't think you're that kind of being, if you don't think human beings are that kind of being, the world here restricts it, um, to certain cultures, then the view doesn't work for you. In just the same way that if you don't think that you're a Hobbes' selfish being, his view doesn't work for you. So in the end, through all of this tale of actual contracts and hypothetical contracts, in the end we come back to the question, what are human beings really like? And there, both Hobbes and Rawls at two historical ends say, it looks as if the best we can do in figuring that out is to look into ourselves and hope that we are thereby able to agree. Thank you.